Oh, dude, that's yeah. so awesome because like your story, it, literally the worst month of your life, as you said, it was like, you know, six months right before, you know, the, the December, January cash out. So that just that six month span, it must have been such a trek up the up the mountain. And then once you actually sold at the top of the mountain, like the euphoria to be able to buy back literally at 50 percent like drawdown. Oh, man, I just I, I can't imagine. I'm so happy that happened for you. GM, everybody, welcome to Flywheel, your number one source for everything crypto, DeFi, and all that's in between. If you want to know what's going on in the world on chain, well, you've come to the right place. This is DeFi Dave here with Capital K, and we're here to help you harness the power of the flywheel. You know what I call this episode? The life flywheel. This is the life. Mm -hmm. This is, yeah, this yeah, is the journey. Right. This is the, this is the hero's journey flywheel of, uh, Mr. Gammy Chan, uh, nice. you know, been around the block since 2011 uh you know i originally met gammy chan uh on the circuit of conferences and you know hit it off met through friends of friends uh i'll never forget the meal he cooked us uh in lisbon that was delicious but you know gammy i've always loved his takes and insights uh on twitter and i saw him talk about you know the whole celeb meme coin thing recently i'm like i should have gammy on it just kind of clicked in my head immediately asked my asked him yesterday and i'm just like you want to come on sure and it's really funny because like first i've had like so many interviews canceled recently and i've been like yeah. can't, i've been like scrambling to like find people and that's yeah, for our yeah, viewers yeah. at home i'm sorry Dave's like, been it, grinding yeah i've been sorry for our like you know not like always on wednesday or thursday uh it's been tough the past few weeks but like this one i think it makes it all worth it because we really go into Gammy story. And if you've been around, if you've either been around, if you're new, if you want to like hear what it's like to you know, have the highest of highs, the lowest of lows, what happens when life smacks you in the face and what it's, you know, what you need to do to like get back up. This is really the episode to listen to. Dude, 1000%. And I think, yeah. you know, this is not one of those episodes where, you know, capital K gets super analytical and kind of. You don't need a notepad. Yeah. You don't need a notepad. You just, just need to come. You know, don't need to do you not need to open your notebook, just open up your hearts and your mind and you're good to go. This you're is one good of to those go. good ones. And we'll get right into it. But before we do, make sure to catch up with every episode to go ahead, subscribe, hit that bell button on YouTube, leave us a comment, let us know what you think, give us a like, follow us on all of our socials on Twitter, TikTok, Telegram, at Flybo DeFi. If you're watching this on Twitter, go ahead, give us a retweet, give us a like, leave us a reply, spread this far and wide. And you can follow me, yours truly, on Twitter at DeFiDave22. You follow me at Zorax, capital underscore K. And let's get the flywheel spinning. All right, everybody. Welcome back to Flywheel. I'm your host, DeFi Dave, and I'm here as always with Capital K. And this time around, we have on the man, the myth, the Chan, Gammy Chan. <laughs> Gammy Chan has, I, I don't know, I, Gammy Chan has just been around, you know, he's been around CT, he's been in crypto for a minute, uh, you know, very famous early Link Bowl, uh, known for his renowned cooking and food tastes around the world and uh, always has something unique to share on the timeline and always has great insights. Uh, recently, Gammy, you were going off around uh, the slub meme coins and like kind of your thoughts around that and a little bit more getting into the deeper picture. And I was like, I should have Gammy Chan on. And then I just reached out and I'm just like, yo, Gammy Chan, come on, you're like word. And now we're here. So Gammy Chan, welcome. Thank you, Dave. That was a nice intro, appreciate it. Yeah, of course, of course. And, uh, you know, before the episode, I had to do my homework. So I felt like a uh, Nardwar a bit. And I'm just like asking people, like, <laughs> yo, like, what do you got on Gammy Chan? And so, oh, no. uh, <laughs> and so I'm just, like, <laughs> first question, Gammy Chan, dirt. for those who are like unfamiliar with you, what is your background? How'd you get into crypto? Uh, I heard you had a mining rig in college for like a BTC ETH mining rig, and it got super hot in your apartment. You know, they were sweating, but you were like, nah, I got to mine this shit. So Gammy Chan, like, what is your origin story? What is your Genesis myth? Uh, yeah, so I've always been like into tech stuff back in like, back in high school, I used to mod Xbox 360s. Like I'd, I'd uh, 
put like Linux on people's Xbox 360s and charge 60 bucks for it. That was like my side job in, in high school. But I would always go on this one, uh, this one website called overclock.net. It's like, um, like a PC modder forum. And I just happened to come across a thread about Bitcoin. Uh, and this was 2011. And uh, back then you could still mine, there were people, it was right when they transitioned from like CPUs to GPUs. Um, and I already had like my gaming computer built. It, um, I was in college at the time and electricity was free where I was staying, like it was included in the rent. So I'm like, I got, <laughs> I got, I got this powerful GPU. <laughs> yeah, I got this powerful GPU. I got free electricity. Um, the only thing I'm losing here is sweating my ass off when I sleep at night because my room is like 90 degrees from running my computer all the time. But I'm like, I don't know, this seems risk free. I just run my computer and I get I get money. How much Bitcoin did you mind in those days? Um, well, yeah, let me just preface this by saying I did unfortunately sell all of them. Um, because whenever I tell people this, they're like, oh, you must be a billionaire, right? Like you started mining and 2011, but um, I was just on that one GPU. I was mining like three or four a day, and then I added a I added a second GPU. I actually so this was when blocks were a full 50 BTC. Uh -huh. oh, I actually wow. I actually mined yeah. my own block. Like so, oh, I was you got I was, one. Oh, yeah, wow. I, well, I was I was part of a pool. I was in Slush's pool, uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, but I was one of the miners that like found a block. So it sucked. Like, I was like, fuck, I should have been solo mining, you know, <laughs> like I would actually have gotten the whole block. Yeah. yeah the whole nut. Um, but I, I had to share my 50, my block of 50 with people. But um, yeah, I mean, I, like I said, I was making, making like four a day on the single GPU and then I added another GPU later, but you know, I'm broke ass college kid. I had like a thousand dollars. So I, I literally like everything I mined, I just sold right away to like pay for food and gas and like books and stuff. So like, I never, I never held any of that. I just, like, yeah. I and at the time, to... what was the price of Bitcoin? It must've been like, uh, when I started, it was a dollar. And then, um, I, it, it peaked at like 32 that first cycle. And then, oh, wow. so this is like your, your fifth That's cycle. Good. <laughs> this is the God. This is the version, right? This is like e cash, uh, right? You 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 really used it as money to buy for food. As, yeah, that this was Satoshi's vision. Yeah, yeah. This is Satoshi's vision. You took the word out of my mouth. Um, well, I actually, I actually have this email that I sent to my dad. It was like April 2011 or whatever, and it was, I like linked him the white paper, and I was like, "Man, you got to check this thing out. Like, you can be your own bank. Like, I was I was one of the like the like fundamental shills." And everybody back then, of course, was just like, okay, dude, whatever you say. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I actually, well, so back to what we were saying how, about like how, what it was at when I started, it was like a dollar and then it went up to like 32 and then I think it crashed all the way down to like two or $3, but I, I sold everything I had at like 20. So locally, like I got out at a good point. The issue was obviously like not buying back at two. But um, I act like literally because my coworkers would not shut up making fun of me, like my summer job that I worked uh, in college. Like anytime I'd bring up Bitcoin, they would just laugh their asses off at me. And they were like, this can't be real. They're like, no way. You're just like getting free money, like running your computer. So I was like, yeah, you want to like, you sure it's not real? I logged in like on the work computer and I sold it and I withdrew it to my bank. And I was like, look, like there's cash in my bank. Like I, I sold, I sold like a hundred BTC at, at like 20 bucks just to like prove Gangsta. a point to them. Uh, obviously regret that one, but, uh, Wait, yeah. was it like Mount Gox by the, back then? Uh, was it OTC? Like how did people sell their Bitcoin? Um, yeah, that Mount Gox was around at that time, but the only options there was like, you couldn't use PayPal yet. It was like. You had to do like a, a money order or there was this like PayPal competitor called, called Dwala. Have you ever heard of Dwala? Yes. Yes, I have. Actually, yeah. I wasn't I even sure for a second if I was remembering the name right. <laughs> yeah. You had, you had to like deposit it. You could deposit and withdraw through Dwala or like literally like physically mailing them a money order. 
<laughs> it, it was like it was pretty stupid. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but I I was I did set up a Dwala account, so I was able to like electronically with. Did you ever do like Linden Bucks from Second Life or no? No, I was never into any of that. Stuff. I thought that was the most interesting way. <laughs> it was just the Linden Bucks. Uh, I okay. didn't. I didn't even know about that. Yeah. Oh yeah, like people would like buy and sell Linden Bucks for Bitcoin. But anyways, so you were mining. Uh, you were there for like the first run up to, you know, a whopping 32 bucks. So it crashed down 99% to $2. And I can't imagine how over it felt in that moment. It's like, wow, like this must be a scam. Like it's so over. Uh, what was it like during that first bear market? Um, so yeah, those first couple cycles, I guess I was one of those stereotypical people that would like leave during the bear and then come back. Cause I, it was like. Well, part of it was also when I would go home for the summer, like I would leave college and go home. And uh, got like, well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That. Um, but like electricity wasn't free anymore, you know, oh, I was, I, I, I'd be at my parents' house. So I, I would stop mining because like I didn't want to run up the electricity bill on my parents and also like heat up the house. I figured that would piss them off. So like I would stop mining in the summer and then I would only mine when I would go back to college. And then also when it was like, so worthless it wasn't like i wouldn't even mind because it just wasn't worth like heating up my room so much and making me uncomfortable every day so it was really like yeah i was one of those guys that would i would leave in the bear and then i'd come back in the bowl to mine again um when it was actually like worth it and um the the like the second cycle what screwed me on that was that was when the asic miners started showing up Mm. And uh, I actually have one sitting on my desk right here, the uh, Butterfly Labs. It was called the Jalapeno. It was like the little mini one that they made. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I had the I bought like the Jalapeno and I bought a couple of like the larger ones. Um, but they were supposed to be, um, they were supposed to be the first ASIC miners to launch. And I only had like $5,000 to my name at the time. Mm-hmm. And I put all 5,000 into buying those ASIC miners. And they wound up delivering, like, I think it was like six to eight months late. Uh, And when I, when I bought, when I bought the miners, I think Bitcoin was like 30 bucks. And by the time they arrived, it was already like four or 500. And that cycle, it peaked at like 1200. Um, So, so like, and also there was another company that delivered the ASIC miners earlier. So by the time I got mine, not only was the price so much higher, but the difficulty had increased too. So I only wound up mining. I mean, it still wound up being like slightly profitable. I think I mined like seven or eight Bitcoin at like, and then sold them at like 1200. So like I got my $5,000 back and then like a couple extra thousand, yeah. but like, it really screwed me because if I just, you know, if I just put that 5,000 in at 30 bucks, never bought it. Yeah. Yeah. It would have done way better than mining. So after, after that, like that was the last I ever mined Bitcoin. I did get into mining um, Litecoin and Ethereum later because that you could do with GPUs. Um, and I just, I just enjoy like building a bunch of extra computers and doing all that. So that's You're like a man a with the project. hands. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 what happened after that, Gammy? Like after you sold, and then you, you kind of top tick, you know, beautifully. You sold the Pico top. Like, what was the next phase? Um, well, it kind of, so it kind of just repeated. Oh, so you left? You left in the bear? Yeah. It, so, like <laughs> the first two, the, yeah, the first, the first two cycles were like, um, yeah, like mine during the bowl leave during the bear. And then like, and I didn't really have any money to like buy the bottom with either. So my situation didn't really change until I graduated college um, and then got a job and like actually had some income and some money saved up. So really like the first cycle that I was able to like really participate in was 2016, 2017. Unfortunately, (laughs) yeah, unfortunately, like, that's 20, 2016 is when I came back and like stayed back a hundred percent and never left again. Um, but before Third that, time's the charm. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, so like Ethereum launched in like 
the better when I wasn't looking at it. So I, oh, I like, so I missed, missed Ethereum it. for like the whole first year. So like when the DAO hack happened and everything, like oh. I wasn't even watching it then. I was like not a part of it any of that. But then I came back like early 2016. I, f- I had found some like LTC wallets I had from like mining LTC. And I was like, uh-huh. whoa, this is like worth something again. And I sold off the like LTC I had lying around for like a few thousand dollars. And that's what my like starting bankroll for the 2016 and the 2017 run was. Wow. Um, but then, yeah, right where it really all changed, like I said, it was, it was a combination of factors. A, a huge part was the fact that like I had a job and actually had money coming in. You hear that, guys? He had a job. <laughs> he had an income. Jobs are good. Jobs are yeah. good. <laughs> I, well, yeah, a little side note on that. I do think it's really important because your trading changes a lot when you need it to be your income. Like you can't, mm. you can't just That's... like – you can't just like buy something and set it aside and be like, whatever, if it goes to zero, it's okay. I still got a paycheck coming in. Now you're like, if this goes to zero, I'm like, I'm not eating. The, yeah, I'm, not I'm eating. like, I'm homeless. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, it changes the dynamic a lot. So I, I do think until you get to a point where like you're really comfortable, it's like, it's a good idea to, to have a, have a job. But um, yeah, so like Chainlink was the first time I was able to actually like put money into something. And when when I bought that Chainlink, I said, I'm not like, it's like an all or nothing for me. I'm not touching wow. it. I'm just holding it. Um, and it, the thing that enabled me to do that was the fact that I had like, I had income. Because I, I was like, like I was saying, how I sent that email to my dad, like back in the, like when I was found Bitcoin, like, I did actually like see the vision a little bit and like was excited about it, but I could never, A, A, I got talked out of holding just because everybody would laugh at me. Yeah. FUD. FUD. And (laughs) yeah, I did. I, I, to be, yeah, I gotta be honest. Like the FUD did get to me just like everybody just looking at me like I was stupid every time I bring it up. And then secondly, like I couldn't even really hold it if I wanted to, like I just needed the money. Um, but Chainlink was the first one where I could just set it aside, not touch it and be like, I got my paycheck. If it goes to zero, whatever, like that sucks, but I'll be fine. And that was like, that was what changed it all. For so me. how did you first discover Chainlink and what stuck out about it? Um, so I was, I was an old 4chaner. Um, I started going on 4chan back in like 2006 and, oh, wow. um, yeah, and whenever I would like, years ago. <laughs> yeah, like, oh like, my god, is that when it first so, came out? No, 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 it came out like two thousand four, two thousand five, or something. Uh, 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 okay, um, but yeah, I would like I would frequent biz occasionally, like you know when I would come back and during the bulls and like what's biz talking about? But there was this um, there was this one poster. I think they just called her like anime girl poster because it was always like an anime picture and like the op. Uh-huh. And uh, she just kept posting links to like the presale for like Chainlink ICOs because they had the, they had the presale, um, and then there was like the public ICO. But the presale you needed to like there was like a minimum, so there was like brackets to it. There was like a hundred ETH minimum on the presale or something like that. Um, so people How much were was like, ETH "Was back then?" Oh, shit, I mean, so this was like this was like. So, September 2007, I guess. I don't even remember. Oh, what 2017? It was. 2017, yeah, not 2007. Um, I don't even remember off the top of my head. That must have been a couple hundred bucks still. Yeah, I think it was maybe like four, four or 500 or something like yeah. that. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was like, I mean, 100 ETH even then was like a lot for like yeah. a single person. To, so Chunky. like, peop, yeah, people were like sp- splitting up these pre sale allocation links. Um, Syndicating. Yeah. Syndicating. Syndicating, yeah. yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. Four chan is syndicating. Four chan syndicating. <laughs> Anime girl syndicate. Yeah, yeah. It's come to fruition um, now, but yeah, continue. Um, but yeah, I just kept seeing like this damn cube keep sh- showing up, showing up, and I'm like, all right, I'll look into this thing. And I went to their site, and I looked at the. Well, first off, on the site, I saw Swift mentioned. Because before Chainlink even existed, um, 
they had won a competition with Swift at their Cybos competition in 2016. So they got like all these privileges and like access to people at Swift. Um, so they already had like Swift connections back in 20, as early as 2016. So they had the Swift logo on the site. And then I went and I read the white paper. And one thing that caught my eye, um, so the, the names on the white paper, it was just Sergey, Steve, and Ari. And Ari, Ari was the ex, yeah, Ari Jules. He was the ex, um, like, chief scientific director at, like, uh, the RSA. It's like the Cryptography Institute. Uh -huh. I, sorry if I messed up his uh, title. I think it was something like that. He was, like, the director of, like, science at RSA. Um, he's, he's, like, he's a legit guy, and he's been cited in so many cryptography papers. And I was like, that... Those two things are what caught my eye right away. Swift and the fact that Ari was working with him. I'm like, this guy's actually like a legit cryptographer. He's been around like before Bitcoin even existed. Um, so yeah, that caught my eye. And then um, after after reading the white paper, took maybe like another week to for it to like settle in and realize like, okay, what they're making actually has like a huge application. Um, back like, so back before Ethereum even existed when it was just Bitcoin, I was like, oh, this is really cool. You can like be your own bank and this is awesome. And you know, it like eliminates all the middlemen, but like, that's kind of it, right? You can just send money from A to B <laughs> um, and that's great. And I think the store of value use case like that, the whole digital gold thing, like that has a tremendous amount of value, but I always wanted to like do more with it um, so when I found Ethereum, I was like, oh shit, like we can actually like, now we have this like programmable money that we can now start actually doing things with and not just sending it from A to B. But the problem was like, it still can't affect the real world. Like you're still, you're like, okay, that's fine if you can program money on Ethereum, but if you can't ever like affect anything in the real world, it's not really useful now, is it? So when I found Chainlink, I was like, okay, this is the thing. Like, this is what the brings it to link. the real world. Yeah, the missing right. link. Yeah, there we um, go. And it just, yeah, it was just like. It just clicked. Man, it, it, yeah, it just felt so obvious. And man, I don't think I've ever had so much conviction in like anything in my life ever. Wow. And then where do the syncocrates come in with like the travels and the sevens and the cubes and the frogs? Um, that start happening? Right. So, um, the the chain link guys they have this thing with sevens i won't say where it came from because that's a little bit of like hidden lore if you know if you know if you know you know kind of thing but um basically suffice it to say sevens are like an important thing for us um so they like show up everywhere but um also like pepe he really started on 4chan like that was like that was 4chan's meme mm -hmm. um and he really like Chainlink always had the most memes. Like if you would go on Biz, like half the posts would be about Chainlink, and all the like funniest memes would be Chainlink. And um, there was a very like tight association with uh, with Pepe. And people people would just post. I don't I don't know if you ever um, you ever see that thing with like Keck. Yeah. About like the like mm -hmm. the Egyptian hieroglyphics. I got something for you. One sec. Okay. Oh man. Oh shit. We got some props. We're bringing in some props. You mean this guy? Yes, that one <laughs> with the yeah yeah. So you see, it looks like he it looks, looks like someone sitting at a computer, right? Like a CRT yeah. monitor, uh, and, and then doing little yeah. mean magic. Yeah, and behind it, it looks like a DNA, like a double helix. Mm -hmm. Well, the word meme, it, where that comes from is memory gene. So it's like DNA, but for memories, because like it's oh. how people like pass on their memories the same way they pass on their like biological genes. They pass on their memories through memes. So people like the, refer to that as being like a, like a the like meme. Yeah. Uh, hieroglyphic, whatever. This but has been by he, my side since 2017. <laughs> yeah, so as, as you can see, like people get pretty esoteric with it. So there was a lot of people just like posting their like synchronicities. Yeah. But I would start seeing there would be like 
hexagons everywhere, sevens everywhere. But some of the like, some of the unexplainable stuff that happened to me was like, I was in, um, I was in this group chat. It was just like 10 of us, uh, all link guys. And I, um, <clears throat> I was visiting some of my friends for the weekend. It was like my friend's wedding. And uh, we were talking during lunch and we were talking about like uh, this article I read on like meme magic. And they mentioned, um, they actually mentioned Shia LaBeouf in it, strangely. Um, do you know, do you ever sh- see that like raid that 4chan did on Shia LaBeouf? Oh yeah, the, the what's it called? The He Will Not Divide Us? Um, yeah, I think that, yeah. Oh, was it the capture the flag thing? Well, it was like, I don't, I don't remember what they called it, but it was Shia LaBeouf was going around doing like, um, anti-Trump videos and he would set up like webcams and 4chan because they just love to do things for the lulls would find out wherever his webcam was and they would put a MAGA hat like on the, like in the frame. And he was starting to get pissed because, like, he, it's just wherever he would go, they would find out. And eventually, he just set up a webcam, like, in the woods. Yeah. And, um, in, like, the he, woods of Finland or something. Yeah. Like, like all, yeah. All you can see is, are, like, trees behind it. And he's like, he's like, screw you guys. You're never going to find this one. Well, turns out you could see a little bit of the night sky. And they were able to, like, see constellations in the sky. Um, and also a plane flew by at some point during the live stream and they were able to get the tail number off of the plane. And, um, also he had like posted on Instagram that he was like in some area recently or whatever. And they put that together. Eventually some guy went and drove around and was like honking the horn on his car and they were doing like hot, cold, like you're getting closer, you're getting farther kind of thing with the honk. Cause they would hear it on the webcam. <laughs> oh my God. And they found it, and they put the hat on. <laughs> um, but I, anyway, this is the kind of a long. Of, no, no, the power of collective intelligence. Yeah, this is kind of a long I, setup for like where the synchronicity happened. But I was telling this to my friends, and um, I, I was like, you know what, my like chain link buddies would really like this story. So I opened up the chat to like message them that we were just talking about it, and they are talking about the same thing with Shia LaBeouf in the chat and it happened like two years before this there was like nothing it wasn't like it was like recent or anything that would have like brought it up again they just happened to also be talking about it i hadn't mentioned it in the chat like before that or whatever it was just like oh i should like go and tell them so then when that happened i was i like explained that to them like oh that's really weird i was just talking about that and then i told them about this like meme uh magic article that i was reading and also how it mentioned this um there's this vinyl record from like 1973 that was called Pepe and it has a picture of a frog on it. And I mentioned that in the chat too. Yeah. Do you, um, yeah, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was going to ask like, wh- what was this article? Like, Oh uh, shit. I don't know. I was just like some blog on like meme magic where it had a collection of like different like meme history things. Maybe I can, maybe I can find it after this and link it to you, but I don't remember the title. Yeah, off the top yeah please. Cause I re- I remember I wrote something like this, like way, like. Oh no! Ago. If it was that, no. <laughs> no, the floor is too so deep. Crazy. If that happens, <laughs> I because I I wrote this. I wrote when I was at Everpedia. I like wrote a Everpedia page about exactly this. I don't know if it's probably, it's it wasn't an article. It's more like a you know it's an Everpedia page. So it's like a wiki page. It might be something else. But like, if it was the Everpedia article, that would be like another crazy synchronicity. No. <laughs> No, All right. I'm kind of scared to look it up because that's going to blow my mind if it is. Can you wait? Can um, you look up? We, we'll do it after the interview. Yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, <laughs> I mentioned the Pepe like vinyl part of it too, and the one guy in the chat who it was like it, he lives in France, so he's like on the other side of the world from me. He's like, he's like, oh, you mean this record that I just bought five minutes ago? And then he sends a picture of it to the chat, like with the receipt, like time stamped. And I'm like, all right, I'm logging off the internet for the day. But like, yeah, stuff like that just happens to me a lot. And, um, it would always be like, I would, I would go and like tell the chat, I'd be like, yeah, the synchronicities are picking up. Like, I think it's going to pump soon. And we would like mark it on the chart too. And they would get like a 200% pump like the next month or two after. Like 
you can go back and look at my my tweets. Um, I had a I had a tweet from uh, July 2021, like the Pico bottom. Mm-hmm. I I called an Uber. Um, we were going to this guy's house for a barbecue. I had never been to his house before, and I took an Uber there. Um, the guy pulls up, and his license plate is like. LNK seven, seven something. And I was like, Oh shit, it's link. And I, I get in the Uber and the song that's playing on the radio, he has like, it was one of those uh, where he has like the digital center console display. So it has Uh like the title of the song. The song was called link up. And I was like, Oh wait, like links going up. (laughs) I arrived at this. Yeah. The song was literally just called link up. And this was after me, like making a comment about his like license plate saying link. And then we arrive at the at the cookout and this guy has little like frog statues, just like like 20 of them, like all over his backyard. And I was like, okay, I got a tweet about this. And I, I tweeted like, yeah, I'm like having like weird link stuff happen to me. Like the bottom's gotta be close. And it was like, that was literally the day at bottom. The day after that, I think was like when we got that big like short squeeze up. Remember that uh, back in 2021 where like, yeah, yeah, Bitcoin squeezed like $10,000 in like an instant. Um, but yeah, that was like, if you put that tweet on the link chart, it was like the Pico bottom in July 2021. You must just feel like I've had enough of this. Like, this is too weird. Yeah, I've had, I've had like, these are just some of the larger ones, but I had the smaller ones too. Yeah, I, 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 I yeah, I'm, I'm go, sorry. Ahead. go ahead. Go ahead. Please. Oh, I was just going to say, I've had people be like, can you stop telling me these? Like they're weirding me out. Like I need you to stop sharing this. With me. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, I want to hear more of it. I love this shit. It's like the, uh, the universe is conspiring to push you towards something. It, it's crazy. No, it's cons- the universe is conspiring in your favor. Do, do you want one, one more? I got one more. Yeah. yeah let's do yeah, one more. Yeah, yeah. Let's do one more. And this was, this was another one that I tweeted. I always try, like, whenever something happens, I always try and, like, tell my friends or, like, tweet about it or something. So that way, like, after the fact, we can go back and be like, yeah, it, like, it ripped after this. Because it always happens to, to pump. But um, I, was, I was driving to see a friend, and there was, like, um, there was a tractor trailer that went by. And it was like from the like Swift trucking company. And you know how like the uh, chain link Swift, like there's all those yeah. connections. I'm like, all right, whatever. But then there was like another logo on the back that was like a blue cube. There was like a blue cube vinyl like pasted on the back of the truck. And I was like, okay, that's a little weird. And then right after that, I drove over a creek that was called Swift Creek. And I was like, all right, it's starting to add up. And then like a mile further down the highway, um, the, I come around a bend. It's like in the woods. This is like North Carolina or something in the woods in North Carolina. And I come around a bend and there's a giant blue bull staring back at me, like a chain link blue colored bull, a statue of a giant bull. And, um, you know, Paul Bunyan, like the kids, I don't know. What is that? A kid story or whatever. Yeah. Paul yeah. Bunyan and like his big blue bull. There's like, I guess it's like an attraction in North Carolina where there's this giant blue bull statue. But I was like, okay, like that's got to be bullish, right? It's like. It's a fucking bull. Yeah, yeah. And it's the same, like I was saying, it's like the chain link blue, like the same blue as the color of the logo. And then I, I get to my friend's house. Uh, I'm telling him all this stuff. And he's, um, we decide to like run to the gas station and get a drink, like the local sheets or whatever. And um, we pull in. He just got this new car and it had like the auto parallel park feature. So he's like, Hey, check this out. And it it, like reversed automatically into the parking spot. So we were like, we were backed into the parking spot looking out this dump truck pulls up in front of us. And I I tweeted a picture of this dump truck, Uh, chain link blue. The whole truck is just blue. And in big letters, all it says on the side of the truck is just link. And the, the truck, the truck just stops right in front of us. Like I said, we were like parked facing us. We were like uh-huh. looking out. It just stopped right in front of us. And the driver just sat there. He like didn't get out or anything. He just like stopped for like a solid 30 seconds and then just kept driving. 
And I look at my friend and I was like, what was that? <laughs> Why did you just stop there? But yeah, just like big, huge letters. Yeah, I tweeted a picture of this truck, um, just huge white letters on the side of this chain link blue truck. And it just said Link. And that was right when Link bottomed. You know how it did that like little deviation of the range at the where it like broke down below $5? Mm-hmm. This was right when it like reclaimed $5 and it ran from like 5 to 15 that like when I, when all this was happening to me, it was like right at like five bucks, like days before it started that run. Wow. Wow. <laughs> wow. That's just, okay. That's, okay. Let's, let's go all the way back there. Wait, when you first built, you, when was your first purchase of link and how did you buy that link? Did you get on either Delta or did you do the 4chan syndicate? Or did, did you add to the position or like, I feel like all those universal signals must have did something to you. Uh, it was Ether Delta right when it launched. Nice. I was like, yeah, that was the only way you could get it. Back then, Ether Delta was, um, that was like, I kind of missed that as much as it sucked, but it was, it was free money because nobody ever wanted to mess with Ether Delta. It was such a pain in the ass. So it was like yeah. a guaranteed like two or three X every time to just buy on Ether Delta, sell when it gets a buy land, finance list. <laughs> it's just free money. Yeah, yep. and I, yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say, so for Ether Delta, I remember the, the hack was like in the URL before they kind of put the uh, ticker in there, you could paste the smart contract address and get the trading pair, right? Yeah. And and like th- that was the hack that that kind of no one knew beforehand. <laughs> and then like but then obviously the edge got diminished. But I remember Ether Delta because I fat fingered one decimal place and I ended up purchasing like 10x on I think oh, District Zero no. X or some 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 other shit. Yeah, I was always afraid I'd do that. That's why I never used Ether Delta. Oh dude, it, it rock- I, in my mind I was like, how can you not? match my order you know like why did you make me buy 10x above the market <laughs> oh yeah that was uh, one memory with the delta uh, you're I never, yeah i never used ether delta but like my first interaction with a smart contract was buying eos from the contract when that ico was happening uh, and, and, and trying to sell it for an arb on an exchange you uh you mentioning district zero x reminded me of zrx because I, I thought you yes. said like ZR, zrx at first i have a bit of a horror story about that because horror. Uh, horror yeah horror story i got a lot of those uh we all have our regrets in crypto don't we yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> makes us numb over time yeah but yeah go but it's this horror story um so this is the story of how i missed out on like eight figures because of a windows update um i got into the zrx ico and how that worked was it was a two-day thing the first day they reserved um you could buy two thousand dollars of it the first day and you had like 24 hours to show up it was Mm -hmm. like a whitelisted thing and then the second day you could buy up to six thousand dollars of it and it was like a first come first serve whenever it ran out it ran out type deal mm-hmm. um i bought i bought the my allocation on the first day but then the second day i had to go to work and it launched like while i was at work um and i wanted to buy the full 6k allocation mm-hmm. um so what i did was i set up like a uh, team viewer like a remote access on my uh-huh. computer and i was like i'll log in from work i had i had the wallet all set up like i i loaded it up with the 6k <laughs> and i had it open up like to the page uh-huh. that you had to purchase and i was like all right all i have to do is log in from work and like click buy and i'm done um i go to log in from work it's like loading 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 fail to connect time out i'm like what the hell's going on and it was like, I worked like half an hour away from my home. I'm like, I can't even, like, by the time I get home, it's going to be sold out. So I finished my work day. I get home. I look at my computer. My computer had restarted because it applied a Windows update and like Windows automatically oh. restarted. No. Yeah. Protecting you. <laughs> right. And, Protecting and investors the, here. Protecting. Well, one of the things that screwed up about it is I was mining on that computer. Um, 
And one of the reasons it hadn't restarted to apply the update was because I had been mining for like weeks. So the computer's been like loaded and it won't restart if you're like actively doing things on the computer. It mm -hmm. only restarts like if it's like idling. Um, but I had thought I was doing the right, I like shut off all the miners because like sometimes they would crash and freeze the computer. So I was like, I don't want to leave those running and like potentially have an issue. So I turned them off. So the computer oh, was no. sitting there idling. And so then Windows and all their intelligence was like, oh, he's not using the computer. Now's a good time to reboot. Yeah. No, no, um, it's not. Well, well, anyway, this this ICO, um, it it ten x and that that money that I made on ZRX is what I rolled into Chainlink. Um, I put all my profits from ZRX into Chainlink, but I would have had like an extra sixty k to put yeah. into Chainlink at ten cents. Yeah, and then yeah. my my Chainlink I held that all the way to fifty dollars. Um, I mean, you know, who knows what I would have done with the extra like sixty k that I would have bought, but like, yeah, let me obviously just do that's math like, right there. Yeah, yeah, so, that's like that's so, regret yeah. math right there. Well, yeah, so, so I make remember it, make, when, it, make it more. Okay. Yeah, right. <laughs> really, when I saw really Chainlink, dig in there. I, I, I saw Chainlink at seventeen cents on Ether Delta, and I remember it very clearly. I, I don't know what the seventeen number. I guess again seven um, was just stuck in my mind. I was just like, man, just blockchain thing touching the real world now that's too difficult to do so i just faded it completely <laughs> well in your defense um it still yeah. hasn't really happened like it is a difficult thing like we still yeah. have a lot of progress to make in that space i'm so, kind of so like, like you know that you know that joke about the linux guys how they're like oh this is the year of the linux desktop and like <laughs> it's always, always windows is done. yeah it's, it's kind of like that for yeah. For us too, like this is the year blockchain is going to go mainstream. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, again, you, you know your your uh, your Windows update just just to put a price tag on it, it it costed twenty mil. Um, you know, casually. Yeah, um, don't don't do that to him. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, no, that, I'm sorry. That's that's true. That's 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 you know pico top prices. So adjusted for today's prices, it's about like you know eight mil. So, oh, okay. Sorry. Oh, oh, well, I'll, Only I'll eight, no. Yeah, whatever. That's fine. Pocket change. I mean, I don't think you can be in crypto without one of these, you know, grand misses or regrets. Like, it's just yeah. all part of paying your dues. Like, we've all yeah. been through this. We've all fumbled these True. massive opportunities. So it's all par with the course. And what matters is you get, you have one time that you make it. And all it takes is one time. Literally. Yeah, it really just does. Get it, right it really does. One time. And then you're able to manage your risk after that. You're golden. You're coasting. I, yeah, I, I agree with that with like, everybody has their regrets and like, you know, we yeah. have our sayings, like you gotta, you gotta pay your tuition. These and lessons I, are priceless. I, I do feel, I actually, in a way, like I'm kind of grateful that I had my early regrets with Bitcoin. Um, cause like, like I said, I, I just sold all that instantly. And that obviously was a big regret for me, even, even back in 2016, 2017, when it wasn't worth as much, um, but I do really think because I had that regret, it helped me diamond hand my link. Mm. Cause I was like, yep. I was like, I know the pain of selling early. I was like, I believed, I believed in Bitcoin, but yet I sold it early anyway. I got fudded out. I was like, I'm not going to let this happen to me with Chainlink. And that's like, that's the silver lining of it. Cause I don't think you, you have to, you have to be a little bit fucked up to hold something 500 X, like you have to have some kind of fire burning in you, so, uh, and yeah. like regret, regret can do that. That's one thing that can, that can help that. But like you, like you don't do that for just normal reasons. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I think, I think my regret really helped me with that. Now I later then learned the opposite end of that lesson, which was holding too long. <laughs> and oh, I got, I got so caught. Bad. Yeah, I got caught in the the May 2021 crash pretty bad. Um, so now oh. you know, now I've now I've been cut both ways. So now I'm a fully fully balanced person. Now I have, I have <laughs> both, both sides of regret. 
what did you hold all the way? Cause I, I remember that drop because I actually uh, I graduated from my uh, MBA on that day. And I remember somebody asked me, like, what was the price of ETH on the day of my graduation? And I was like, oh, it's 3,333. And I screamed that very <laughs> loudly. And literally, proceedingly, the next day or so, it just nuked. And then for the next month, it just nuked 65%. And I was like, yeah. No, <laughs> it's over. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so what was your, your uh, thing that you held on for too long, Gandhi? Was it like? Um, well, so- yeah, it was. It was like because, like I was saying, I I held Link all the way up to like the top at fifty three. From bucks. ten cents uh-huh. from, to fifty. From 50 ten bucks. cents to fifty three. Yeah. Wow. Um, Fuck. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, what I what I did? So, like, I was I was one hundred percent. I took I took everything I had and put it in Link. It was I was one hundred percent allocated to Link for years, and then what happened was Ave showed up. And I was like, okay, I can stay 100% allocated to Link. I'll just borrow some USDC and like the other stuff I want to buy, I'll just buy like borrowed against my Link. And that worked really well for a long time. And I traded up like eventually this, like the stuff that I traded up with my borrowed money wound up becoming as big as my like Link stack. Oh, shit. Um, so like that went really well. And I got to, I got, I mean, I was, I was really comfortable and I got to a position where I was like, all right, like I, I was only levered up like one and a half X. Like it wasn't, it wasn't crazy. Cause like Reasonable. my like health, but like my health factor on Abe was good. And I was like, I wasn't too concerned about it. I knew like, you know, I've been around for a long time. I know crypto has like a lot of volatility. I knew like, 10%, 15% drops like are not uncommon. But I was like, I had I had such a buffer built up. Cause like I said, like I traded up that stack with the borrowed money to like mm-hmm. be worth so much more than I actually borrowed. So I was like, it, it doesn't even like even if it falls like 20%, I'm fine, like whatever. Mm-hmm. And I just kind of had basically like a like a mental trailing stop loss. I couldn't actually like physically apply a trailing stop loss. Part of the issue was with the money in Ave, I couldn't set like if the link was yeah, just sitting on Coinbase, I could like have resting stops. But on Ave, you can't you can't do that. Um, yeah. And that's one of the that's it's one of the things that screwed me. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's your stop. Yeah. Oh my god. Um, but yeah, you. Um, so that that was part of the issue. But I was like, I was like, whatever. I, I'm like, I have such a buffer built up. Like, I'm gonna let it ride, and. I'm not, I'm like, I'm not going to let it fall more than like 20%. If it falls more than 20%, I cash out. And like that, I was willing to like lose that much of what I had, but it was like any more than that I need to like keep. And, um, then it was what, like May 18th and and uh link crashed. Yeah. When I went to bed, link was like $40 and I woke up to it at $20. (laughs) So, so a 50% crash while I was sleeping. And like I said, I was one and a half times leverage. So it was actually more like a 75% to an 80% crash for me. Um, so I lost it almost all uh, while I was sleeping, like overnight. Um, and yeah, and I, I went, yeah, I was like, I was so comfortable. Cause like I said, I had such a, I had such a buffer built up. I was like, oh, I could, you know, I could take a 20% haircut, no problem. And like, well, you can imagine still a 50% confident. haircut. Yeah, it just, um, yeah, no, I did not imagine at all that overnight link would fall 50%. Like, I mean, I've seen a lot of volatility. Like, I mean, obviously I was around for the COVID stuff, Mm -hmm. but like that had a catalyst at least. Like, I didn't expect to go to bed on a night that like, yeah, it had like started pulling back, but like there wasn't any, like, I yeah, I just... I don't know. Nobody expects a a fifty percent wick, <laughs> um, but yeah, that's that's what we got. That's yeah. so gnarly. I'm getting flashbacks to like my experience that time, and I had the same thing, but I just had like with ETH. I had like a bunch of ETH, and like same thing. It just wicked down, and like I remember like I lost like a good chunk of it, and at the same time, I had to like sell more taxes. I'm just like. Wow, it's like so over. <laughs> I never forget that. I'm just like, no. <laughs> oh my god, you just like uh, threw me back to that. 
another thing that that's messed up about it is like I was I in the pro I was in the process of cashing out, like planning my cash out. Like I had oh. the like the week the week before it crashed. You good, Dave? A few moments later. Sorry about that, uh, Gammy. Sorry, what you were saying? You were you were planning your setting cash it up. You're setting, setting it up. Cash out. I was I was saying another thing that like makes that time extra difficult for me was I like I was actually in the process of like planning my cash. Like I was aware like it's time to leave soon. Like um, I had just like the week before it crashed, I had t calls with uh, two different accountants. Like I was trying to like tax, like minimize my cash out, like get some advice on like, how do I not have like the world's largest tax bill on this? And um, also my, uh, my grandfather passed away like right before, like the week before the crash. And I, I put everything on hold, like those like appointments with the accountants. And I just like stopped everything. And we, like, I went home for the funeral and, and all that. Um, and man, it was just like such an unfortunate, like, it was like, uh, like, obviously it's my fault that I left the opening for that to happen. Like you should never, you should never let this, be even possible but it it was also like a conspiring of events like right it just feels like everything came together to screw me in the like there was just this little path that of things that had to happen to come together to screw me and like that's what happened but i mean that's kind of how the market works right is like yeah if you like if and you leave if you leave that path open like it, it finds its it, way to it and this is not the first story I've heard before of personal happenings and events uh, kind of affecting what happens in your portfolio. I had friends with like breakups or I had friends like with you with, you know, I'm sorry for your loss. And, you know, it, like life happens, but the problem is life happens, but the market doesn't stop for life. The market is just this objective, arbitrary thing. It has its own it just, life. It has its own life. And it has, it's going forward and it's just, it's just unfortunate because we do as like, as human beings, we do need to take the time to take care of ourselves mentally and we can't always be there, but like the same time, you know, the market's still moving. It just sucks that this is the way it is. 24 seven markets, you know, this is just the way it is. It's not like the stock market. Oh, it's closed on the weekend. Like, oh, it's closed <laughs> on the holiday. I can like take this time to like go and rest and but like no, it's like twenty four seven. So not, I, yeah, like, not only I is it twenty four seven, it's highly volatile on top. Of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, um, oh. Yeah, it, it's tricky because I, I feel like, like, I feel like a bit of advice for that. Like, if you have life shit going on, like close out your positions. But 100%. also, that's not like that's not always really possible. Like for me in that yeah. case, like so my link. That was obviously I was in the long term tax bracket. So when mm -hmm. I sell, like I trigger that tax event. Cap gains. And then yeah. yeah, and then if I buy back, now I'm in the short short term tax bracket. So it's like tax disadvantageous for me to sell mm -hmm. unless it's like the time where I'm like selling to get like I just wanna hold it until it's time for me to cash out and then I walk away, but it's like I don't wanna trade that. So I didn't wanna I didn't wanna be like Oh, I've got my, I've got this stuff going on, and I can't watch the market. I should sell all my link because then I trigger a massive tax bill. Um, and also, there's not like, there's not too many great ways to hedge, especially for like U.S. citizens that don't have good access to options. Mm -hmm. um, like, I'm really excited to get some options on the like Bitcoin ETF because I think that's going to be an awesome way to hedge. Um, Mm. Yeah, yeah, Those but blocks, like, baby, yeah, that's so rough, man. Please go, yeah. keep going, keep going. Like, how, how did you come out? Like, you know, it, yeah, you like, cannot end the story here. There must be like a there must be a comeback. rise again. Like, you know? um, did, did you ride home season? Did, were you in the AVAX rush? Yeah. What happened? Well, that I mean, that was that was the worst month of my life, probably. Um, combination of losing like one of the most important people in my life, and then losing almost all my money um it's just uh, and, getting chills yeah. man oh man, yeah it was really? like those two things happened in the in within one week of each other 
and then like yeah it just it was it was a rough rough time that that summer but um i held through link link recovered back up um unfortunately link didn't go on as strong of a run on that second leg as a lot of other stuff did um so i didn't i didn't make it all back but i am thankful that on that second leg i cashed out um like between like December 2021 and like January 2022. So I sold and then, yeah. And then I became like a pretty vocal bull. I think I got like a good, like a lot of my attention that I got came from like, or or, did I say bull? I meant bear. Yeah, bear. I I became, yeah, I'm like, by default, I'm always a bull, but like a rare, rare time, like high time frame, like multi year, mm-hmm. I'm always, always a bull. A blue bull, on crypto. big one. Yeah. South yeah. Carolina. Big big bull. <laughs> um, but like, yeah, I flipped, I flipped bear there. And um, that was, that, like, I guess that was my comeback because it, it felt really good after getting screwed so hard to like sell the top. And actually, like, I, um, so I like full full stack put like all my link into Ave, borrowed um, link against it, sold all the borrowed link, so I had I was like net neutral. Oh okay. Um, and then um, I bought back at like six or seven dollars. Um, so like. I stayed hedged the entire way down, like F, like Luna collapse. I avoided all that and everything. Like, so that was like, that felt great for me to be like. Tim, you're in the trenches here. Like if, if I would have, if I would have fucked it up twice, I would have hated myself, man. <laughs> like yeah, after, yeah. after getting crushed and like knowing how bad that feels, like that, that helped me. That helped me cash out yeah, on the I'm second sure. leg up. Yeah. yeah. Again, like, I, like, I need a six month gap. Yeah. Yeah. I just like, I need to protect what I have left is like what it felt like. Oh, dude, that's yeah. so awesome because like your story, literally the worst month of your life, as you said, it was like, you know, six months right before, you know, the, the December, January cash out. So that just that six month span, it must have been such a trek up the up the mountain and then once you actually sold at the top of the mountain like the euphoria to be able to buy back literally at 50 percent, like drawdown oh man i just I, I can't imagine i'm so happy that happened for you yeah yeah thank you unfortunately yeah. that wasn't a total win i had a lot of like a lot of small cuts too i guess that's like normal yeah that's a bit of advice yeah, I, have I have to, to say it's like, like your story is a very real story that I'm sure a ton of people have gone through in crypto on CT, but we don't really hear it on the timeline because it's not, you know, in, it's not really like the proper engagement bait. But like these like war stories, and I think like the over, the overarching theme here is even when you were down, even when you were down in like the lowest of the pits, you took what you like needed to learn and you fought your way back up. You fought your way back up. You got up, you used what you learned, and you know what? You you made it back. You made it back. You maybe some small cuts here and there, but like there's this there's this trajectory up, and the trajectory up is never just a straight line. You're gonna have your ups. You're gonna have your downs. You're gonna have your you know peaks, and then you're gonna have your tranches. So you know, I I just have to say like this is a you know thank you for sharing this. This is a very real story for like you know either people have gone through or like people are new and they're hearing this right now. They can learn from this. So, yeah. Yeah. Th- yeah. Thank you for having me. Yeah. I think it's important to like, like at least, at least learn something when you get, when you get steamrolled, you know, yeah. and like some, some of the worst trades that like upset me the most, I guess, are the ones where like, cause like sometimes you have a good thesis and you execute it well and like the market just moves against you and sometimes there's there's not a lesson <laughs> <laughs> there is a like, lesson <laughs> yeah and like mayhem like, for those, mayhem <laughs> like those are the frustrating ones i feel like like at least at least when i can be like oh you know what i i should have 
done this. Like, I'm going to do that better next time. Like, at least I can walk away with that. But sometimes when it's just like, oh, the market just moved against me. Yeah. Sometimes like, there just isn't any God. Sometimes it's just like, people <laughs> yeah. are godless. Yeah, it's just <laughs> like, it's just, the market is just godless. Well, it's like, yeah, I, I, um, uh-huh. I was just going to say, it reminds me of that, um, the Soros quote about how he shorted um, the Great uh, glo- uh, <clears throat> no uh, global financial crisis in 2008, but he sized up too large and he was like, he was a little too early on it as well. So like the local volatility, <clears throat> it wound up like going up a little bit before it went down. So like his thesis was right. Um, he just like, he sized up on it too much too soon. And then he wound up having to like cut some of the position at a loss because it moved against him. And then ultimately he was right, but he wound up making less money than if he just like sized it smaller and was able to hold through that volatility. So like sizing is a really important thing because sometimes, me, yeah. Yeah. This reminds me of Big Short. Oh yeah. Like what, how long did it take then? Like it was it took like, like a year. year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Like you can, and like, actually I, f- I feel like a lot of good trades work like that where like you go underwater at first. Yeah. Um, and like, yeah, a lot of times it does like it moves against you first, and that's, then that's, yeah, uh, uh, like, but like if you if like your thesis is right and like you persevere through that local volatility, because like, you know, there's a hundred different ways you can get from point A to point B, and like if your thesis like if your thesis is right and it does get to point B eventually, like. It might go there in a straight line. It might nuke fifty percent first and then go there. So, like, <laughs> there's a lot of different things that can happen in the interim. Even if you're right, even if your thesis is correct, and I think like a lot. I had a tweet recently about like a lot of the great forecast traders, like like GCR. They are they're high time frame. They have this like fundamental thesis that they think is going to play out. Some like miss valuing in the market that they identify or some catalyst that they are able to see that other people don't. So they bet on that and they see something that's like a high odds of happening and they size it appropriately that they can withstand it like being wrong in the short term. So long as they're right, like in the long term and they, they just zoom out and they're patient and they wait for their thesis to come correct. And yep. I mean, that doesn't obviously that sometimes the thesis is just wrong, but like, that's why you have invalidations. You need to have like, if your trade's based on a thesis, you should have a thesis based invalidation, not so much like a price based invalidation. Cause it's like, you know, if the price moves five or 10% against you, it doesn't necessarily mean your thesis is wrong. It just means like the market flows are causing the price to move it's, against what's you. What's an right example now. of a thesis invalidation? Um, so like, I don't know, my, my chain link trade was thesis based or like, let's take another big, another trade that was like big for me was AMD. And that was like totally thesis based. And I think that one's maybe a better example because it has like a clearer invalidation. But um, back when AMD was two bucks in like 2016 or whatever, um, they, again, because I follow like all the tech news, I was aware of like leaked information on their upcoming architecture, um, which became the Ryzen chips that they have now. So this was like before the first gen Ryzen back when they had like the bolt that was called bulldozer was like their their chips back then. Um, But they, AMD sucked back then. Intel was so much better and Intel had been better for an entire decade. So Whenever you would mention to somebody like, oh, I think AMD is going to make a comeback, they would just like laugh in your face. They're like, no, they're never going to catch up to Intel because it had been 10 years of them getting outperformed by Intel. It just seemed impossible. But this information leaked about their architecture and it was looking like they were going to get like a 50% performance increase, which to put that in perspective, Intel each generation gets maybe like a 5 to 10% mm-hmm. performance increase. So in this one generation, it looked like they were going to make up for an entire decade of underperforming. Mm -hmm. Um, And they had also hired this guy, Jim Keller, who's like a kind of legendary chip architect, but that that's it. Like that's, that's the thesis of the trade is just AMD is going to release this chip 
that suddenly makes them competitive again with Intel after not being competitive for 10 years. And that causes a lot of like, that has to get priced in a lot. <laughs> like 10 years of not being competitive was priced in. And if they become competitive overnight, like that's a huge change. Yeah, but where, like, yeah, so how you would invalidate that's pretty easy. And that's just simply if they launch the product and it doesn't perform. And then, okay, like the, the information I had about the performance was wrong and I'm out. Um, so that's like, I think that's a good example of like a fundamental invalidation versus a price invalidation. Mm, so it didn't perform how you expected, basically. Well, it, it did, but I'm saying if, um, if it hadn't, I oh, would have, like, I would have, yeah, oh, I would have exited, if, yeah. I would have exited oh, the trip. Like, so like after, if they, oh, I get it. So F, so let's say it didn't make that move. Let's say, okay. It had that, uh, you know, let's say the rumors boost. were false. Yeah. So like they, they launched and it was a huge, like AMD at the time had like 1% of server market share. And now I think they have almost half of it. Um, uh, it was like, Oh, so you were proven right there. Okay. Got it. Yeah. yeah, yeah so they launched that, that first generation chip when it launched, it did come in at like 45 to 50% faster. If it had come in at like 20% faster or something, I would have sold everything because it wouldn't have been competitive with Intel. And it would have just been the same old story of like their business model before that was basically just like sell worse stuff, but a lot cheaper. And they weren't making much money doing that. Got it. Yeah, that's that's really good that you have that the discipline to come in though. It's like some other folks may be like, oh, wait, next year is going to be the one where they really have yeah, the, next the, year. The this is the year. Or, this is the year. You know, so it, it's good to have that really strong kind of invalidation. Um, well, I, I think you hit on an important thing there and like this may sound like an obvious statement but i think a lot of people don't really abide by it is it's just you want to buy before things are good right like you don't want to buy it after they release their good chip you want to buy before they have a good chip <laughs> um because then like that's how you capture the price appreciation obviously but i, I mean it's just i guess it's a psychological thing because it's really hard like when everything currently is very bad, it's hard to envision a future where it could be good. But that's like what you have to do. Like where that's what makes a good investor. Yeah. yeah like yeah. what where price changes come from is from something going from good to bad or bad to good. And you have to like you can't let your current what's happening currently change how you assess what the future will be. So do you see anything? Oh, go go ahead, kid. Oh, I just wanted to add a little color to that. Is um, I saw this pod with with uh, Crypto Messiah and, and and Taiki, friend of the pod, shout out Taiki, and he said like hitting the sell button, you need to be like you got to feel great hitting sell. But he says like it's such a psychological barrier because when you hit sell, it's like you're almost giving up on the dream a little bit. You know, you've given up on that like you know that that hundred x that thousand xer. And he says, like, you know, you got to get that out of your mind because probabilistically that's not going to happen and you need to get addicted to hitting the sell button. And I felt like that is such a powerful message, right? Because it really does feel like you're kind of giving up on the dream when you hit that red button instead of the green one. Yeah, honestly, that's something I could work on myself. At, I think actually. I'll, that's I'll like, work on. That's a, yeah. that's a weak spot of mine. I'm one of those that likes to swing for the fences. Um, so I like... Um, Mo like most of my trades at some point, like they have been at least in a little bit of profit. <laughs> um, like at some point in the lifetime of the trade, like it enters profit, I just wind up not taking it. <laughs> and same, uh, same yeah, same. many such cases. Because I'm, yeah, I'm just swinging, swinging for the fences. You know, Gammy, I would love to bring all of that lessons and hard earned experience into this cycle right now, if you know, for the listeners at the end of this pod, as we're coming to a conclusion, like what are some of the way you're navigating the current cycle and how do we also sell the Pico top like you did? Wait, I, and I was going to, this is going to be my questions. Like, is there anything now that you're seeing like, you know, before that's hot and popular? Um, well, I guess some of my, some of my bags are show me. <laughs> well, um, I, st I still like I still like Link. Um, 
I get, I, I feel like people think I'm crazy because I'm always talking about Link and, you know, it's, it's CT's most hated coin. But, uh, I mean, they got so much stuff coming up on the horizon. Actually, my, my pinned tweet right now is like kind of summarizes my Link thesis um, better than I would do it right now live. But basically, I mean, they're working with the largest institutions in all of America and it's coming at a time where politicians in the U S have just pivoted to pro crypto. Mm -hmm. So like, it's only going to get better for them. Like all these companies that link is doing pilot tests with that are like holding off on launching into production. Like Mm -hmm. they're just waiting on better regulation. So now that government has flipped pro crypto, like that's the odds of that happening just went up tremendously. So I think like, the odds that we see some major US financial institution launch a product that uses Chainlink in the next year or two, like just went up tremendously. And yeah, so that's like the core of my link thesis. They're they're gonna be basically the the interface for banks and other US financial institutions to interact with on-chain things. And BlackRock is pushing to do more things on-chain, like they have their like build fund and they're tokenizing um, like treasuries and they want to tokenize more assets. Like Larry Fink's been talking about like tokenization, tokenization, tokenization. They want to, like it's a whole new asset class they can sell to people. They can just take everything that they're already selling, wrap it up in a token and now sell it as like this whole new market. So it's like so much money that they can make. Um, and Chainlink is going to be like the interface to all of that. Like they just log in through CCIP and they can connect to any chain, any product through that. And I just, I mean, that just seems so huge to me. Um, I have some, I have some Ondo too. Um, although I reduced that exposure a little bit on this like last leg up, like that breakout from 85 that I was calling. Um, I like prime. I just think, I think that thesis there is really simple. Like it's a quality game and games make like so much money. Um, I like AR. They've got, uh, I suggest people I look into AR. it. Kid yeah, loves they... AR. Oh my God. <laughs> I love just... AR. <laughs> like, guys, I'm a good company here. Yeah. Um, yeah. They, I suggest everybody look into AO computer. That's going to be a big thing. Oh yeah. I heard all about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's so actually. Let me just show you back. Let me leverage <laughs> show your show right now. <laughs> you know, yeah, go for like, it, man, dude. Ao, I I'm gonna say now on the pod is like capital P primitive. It is a it's gonna be a new way that we're going to blockchain. Okay, like it's it changes the way we see a blockchain, think about a blockchain, and I just think it it will completely change the game. And it shouldn't be very tribal because you can run any VM you want on top of it. So if you want to bring your SVN, you want to bring your EVN, you want to bring your ABCD VM, whatever you want, <laughs> you know, it will work. I love it, man. Good show. But yeah, those, I guess those are probably my like primary spot bags. And then, I don't know, just in and out on my you- trading day to day. But like, those are the stuff that I'm like holding for fundamental reasons. Do you trade perps? Do you look at like OI, CVD funding and all that kind of good stuff or just a thesis, um, get in and wait? I've That's that's something I'm still in the process of improving, like coming up with a more um, fixed like framework and also like automating. So I, I need to automate more of it and like mm-hmm. write like – my, my background's in computer engineering, so I could easily write up some scripts to, like, scan for all this shit, but here I am still doing it manually. But, like, I don't know, a lot of it, uh, this is, like, this is bad advice for people out there, but a lot of it, for me at least, I'm, like, very feel-based. Um, and I don't have, like... Vibes. Yeah. It's, I don't... I, like... I'm, like, a holistic trader, I guess. I look at, like... I look at a lot. And that's like that's a pro and a con, I guess, because some like yeah, everybody has style. I, yeah. yeah, sometimes I can get like too lost in the weeds, and there's like there's data you don't want to be looking at that's not like I guess you like I, I try and I guess I see it like a like a polynomial equation, right? You have like factors that are 
different powers, and you want to find the factors with the highest power. And those are like changing day by day, because like, like how like how Ethereum is going to trade into the ETF. Like I'm now looking at different things than I would if there wasn't an ETF, because like the those factors are different, and also like the coefficients and the powers for the factors are different. To like the weighting of, whereas normally like, I don't know, if I saw some indicator flash, like depending on the scenario that I'm in, I'll, I'll like view it differently. Like, oh, that's not important right now because there's some other thing that's more dominant. Mm -hmm. Or like, like today, I like, or I, I tweeted either yesterday or two days ago about the Chainlink Swift conference and how I thought like it's going to go down. Um, it's going to go down. It's going to go up. <laughs> well, it, what, it's been going up. It's been going up a lot. Like people have been pricing in. Um, they had this big news with DTCC. Oh, yeah. Which, yeah I heard they, that. Yeah. They, literally, they settle literally all the derivatives. It's quadrillions yeah. of dollars annually. It's like ridiculous. Um, but they did a pilot test with them. So that news was getting priced in. And also people were pumping it leading into consensus because they were having a talk with Swift. And I'm looking at it like I've been seeing all these articles about like, oh, Chainlink's having this like announcement with Swift because like uh, people saw the talk. I'm like, well, they've had like two or three talks with Swift before. I don't think this one's going to be a big deal. I think people are like pricing it in way too much. And so like the thesis behind that trade was purely just based on like positioning, positioning before the event and like what I think the flows will be after the event, you know? So that had not, there was like no indicator or anything I used for that. It's just, I noticed it's going a lot up a lot into the event. So people are clearly positioning long into the event. And I just expected the event to be underwhelmed. Like, I don't think this is the event where they announce like some massive product with Swift, right? Mm -hmm. But like, that's how people were pricing it in. It was like ripping before the event. So I'm like, odds are this is going to be a disappointing event. And like, you mm -hmm. see that on most like event trading. What's really important with event trading is looking at what happens before the event. Is it selling off into it? Is it pumping into it? Because that gives you an idea of like what the positioning is before the event. And that's why you see these things like on like CPI days or whatever, where you get like good news, but it sells off. But that that's because everybody like already it's positioned like long, yeah, already positioned priced long in. before it, right. And like once everybody's already bought, well, buyers are just future sellers. So the, the flows <laughs> after the event are just like sell dominated. Um, and again, these are just like um, the only thing you need to look at on the chart for to like make this assessment is literally just the price. Like it's not, I guess, I guess volume too, because mm -hmm. you want to have some idea of like how many people are buying, but like it's not based on any kind of indicator or anything. It's just like, yeah, how, how are people positioned and how, how do I think they're going to be positioned tomorrow or a week from now? Yeah. No, we hear you here. Uh, I want to uh, kind of change course a bit as we get near the end. We usually do a lightning round, but since you're such a renaissance man, you know, with your high-end audio equipment, with the cars <laughs> that you're upgrading and refurbishing, and with being the quote-unquote Bourdain of CT, I want to get into all that <laughs> real quick. Like, we'll do like super quick on, on each. But uh, yeah, let's talk about your passions outside of crypto and trading. Uh, high-end audio. Uh, how'd you get into that? Like, what are you listening to now? Like, what are you looking for? Like, where did the passion of that come from? Um, I guess, I guess before I answer that, I would just say one thing to people listening is I, I do think it's important to just like play and ex like experiment and just like dabble, dabble in things, you know, and just like explore learning things and have fun with stuff. And like, that's how, how you wind up learning. Um, so all these like hobbies that I have are just like, I find something I get interested in and I'm like, Oh, how does this work? And I like, start yeah, to write, like, yeah, right. Or like buy some new electronic and I'm like, what's going on in here. And so I grab the screwdriver and just like tear it apart and like figure out what's going on. And I think like, um, 
uh, one of my favorite stories of like that kind of like the benefits of that kind of living is um, uh, Steve Jobs. He took a calligraphy class in college just because like he was like, oh, this seems cool. Like I like calligraphy could be fun. And then it wound up giving him the idea like Mac was the first to do changeable fonts on computers, like a thing that's like so basic now, but like they were the first to do it. And it's because he had experience with fonts from taking a calligraphy class. Like you never, you never know how learning about one random thing like might tie into something else in your life. And I, th I think it's just important to like be open to that experience and just try and have like, stay stay broad a little bit before you like focus down because you can like reach into that experience from other fields but anyway i went off on a little bit of a tangent there but your question was like how did i get into audio mm -hmm. um i don't know i guess um <laughs> I got, well, really my, my first, my first headphone was, I bought, there was this company called Fostex and it started off as like a modding project for me. Like I was, like I said in the beginning of the podcast, how I'd like would mod Xbox 360s and stuff. I like mm -hmm. modifying and like building things, but I found out there was this headphone you could get for pretty, like relatively cheap. I think it was like $75 or a hundred dollars or something like that. But, um, the thing was the driver in the headphone was like really good, but the like housing that they put around it was like this thin plastic that made it sound bad. Um, but you could tear it apart and fill it with like modeling clay to kind of like dampen it and also like cotton and you could adjust the like the, the base parts on it and stuff. So you could like tweak it. Um, there's actually this company called ZMF Headphones the founder of that company, he started the same way. He started just by like modifying these Fostex headphones and like he would sell them at a markup after he would mod it. He would like buy them for 75 bucks, mod them and then sell them for 300 or whatever. But now he has like his own headphone business. But yeah, that's how I got, it just started as like a, like a tinkering project. And then where I got like really big into it was during COVID because, you know, I'm locked in the house just trading all day. Yep, yep. And I'm like, well, I listen to so much music I may as well get a nice pair of headphones. And I, I tend to be one of those people that like when I get into something, I can't just do it like a normal person. They got to go 250%. Uh, full, full nut. Yeah. yeah. Full. So I, yeah, like I just spend hours reading about it and it's kind of a problem. <laughs> I should be putting my time towards something more beneficial, but. So I picked these up as well too. Oh, and, nice. Uh, yeah. 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 I, same thing Those I said are... like, during the during COVID. I just I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna go ham. And I also got like a whole amp and DAC from a uh, Firefly. Like, it just looks yeah. sick. You know? Nice. So, yeah. yeah. Those eight. Those eight hundreds. <laughs> those are those are good. Those are classic. And, yeah. and now with cars, are you like working on or upgrading anything now? Like, what's your story with cars? Um, my well, my I guess I have my dad to thank for that. He's always Papa been Gammy. To, <laughs> yeah. He's always been into cars and motorcycles, so I, I grew up around it. I grew up playing Gran Turismo as a kid also. That was a big part of it. Um, but yeah, just um, kind of the same. It's like the same story for all of this. It's like I have an interest, and it's like, oh, I want to learn about this. So I start like tearing things apart. It's like, oh, I get a, I got a car. Well, all right, I got to like tear down the engine and see what's happening in here and just like replace all the parts. And after like... <laughs> After a while of just like, like, oh, I want to upgrade this, this, this. And like, eventually you find yourself at a point where like you've torn apart everything in the car and you know how every part of it works and just kind of happens naturally like that. And then what happened with food? Like, I, I'll never forget when we were in Lisbon and you cooked that delicious feast for all of us. <laughs> And it was such yeah. a wholesome, homely meal, getting everybody together like that. Like, where did cooking come from? And, like, what are your favorite dishes to cook? Um, well, first off, that that uh, dinner in Lisbon was great. It's always nice, like, especially nice to, like, share your food with, like, friends and family. And um, just, like, I don't know, I feel like it's one of the most 
pure ways to like care for somebody, you know, like you're literally providing them life. <laughs> you're giving them food, just life sustenance force. to live. Right. Mm -hmm. And just like, I don't know. It's, it's so nice, right. To like put work into something and then to share it with people and then to see the smile on their face as they enjoy it. It's like, I don't know, so sad. Like it was so nice, like standing next to the table and just seeing everybody like dive in and enjoy the food. It was and, delicious too. Oh, thanks, man. Um, glad you liked it. But yeah, I love cooking for people. Um, and also, it, again, it comes back to like it's a creative thing for me. Most like, I guess that's the big thing that's behind all of it. Is just like I like the act of creation and building. Like, and you know. Um, funny story about me going into computer engineering. I took like a, I took a test in college that was like, what career should you be in? And uh, they all came back like all like it was like musician, writer, poet. It was like all these like none of them were like engineering. And I, I kind of made me think for a second. And I was like, well, you know, like, like software engineering is kind of the purest creation there is, right? You start with just a blank sheet, you write code, and you can make it do whatever you want. It's pure creation. So, and when I started to think of more of my hobbies like that, um, that I do find that's behind a lot of it, like the cars, um, that like building and tweaking it, and also I like seeing improvements. Like a car is something you can have a measurable improvement in. Like when I change something and then my lap time gets faster, it's like I actually see the impact of my work and what I've done. And that's satisfying. And I guess trading is like that too, right? Like you have a thesis, you take a trade and you get that like instant feedback loop of like, oh no, I screwed up or like, oh, I did really well. Good job. Yeah, no, I, I see that completely. Um... But yeah, uh, Gammy Chen, uh, one last question before we go. Uh, also, I, I love how, even though for like most of the interview, like we were just like, like your life in crypto, your whole journey and everything. And uh, for like a lot of people, like they may see like, especially if they're just following on Twitter, that maybe all that is. But then like, uh, this is a whole other side of you with cooking, with cars, with audio, with headphones and gear. Like, you're really it's just a very well-rounded human being. Oh, well, thank you. I, I try. Yeah, we you know, I, the, the, how people say touch grass, like, it's a good thing. Yeah, get out. Yeah, go tinker, touch, touch grass. grass. Yeah. yeah. Um, one last question, and we always ask this at the end of the show. Um, who would you recommend as a guest? Uh, who do you want to see on Flywheel? Ooh. That's a tough one. So many good people in the space. Um, Actually, a name comes to mind, uh, Anteater. Anteater. Do you, you know him? I he, agree. Uh, I feel like he's had, uh, he's had a really good come up. Out, out of like the people that I follow, I feel like he's grown the most. Like mm, Anteater. He, I don't, yeah. I'm not familiar. I, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm part of his Telegram channel. Gammy, could you actually make an intro? I, I, I definitely appreciate that. I would love to bring him on too. He's a very interesting guy uh, from reading yeah, all he, his thoughts. Yeah, he's um, he's grown so much, and he's he's a good example of just like how the community in CT is so powerful. Because he's one of those guys that when he got started, he had like no fear about just cold DMing people and being like, "Hey, can you like help me with this?" And like, "What do you think about this?" And he like just got a lot of feedback from people, and he grew so fast doing that. And like, you know, he would he would DM me asking my thoughts on something, and now like. I'm asking him his thoughts on stuff. Like he's 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 grown a lot. Wow, Anteater. All right, yeah. Good. We'll take note. Uh, and Gammy, where can people find you uh, on Twitter and whatnot? Uh, yeah, on Twitter, I'm just uh, my name's Gammy Chan. G A M M I C H A N. Gammy Chan, go follow. Uh, Gammy, thank you so much for joining us. This was a lot of fun. Uh, thank you for sharing your story your highs, your lows, your comebacks, you know, it's all, all part of the experience. Uh, so, you know, hope to see you soon, IRL, and hope to see you on the show as well. Thanks for having me, guys. It's been fun to remin reminisce with you. Thanks. All right. Uh, see you around.
Wow. Uh, finishing off that episode, a real personal story, honestly, with Gammy Chan. Uh, this is right. the host game. I'm your host, T-Fi Dave, here with Capital K. And, you know, it's – we usually – and for the longest time, we've had projects on. We've had, you know, people – talk about what they're building kind of or like what they're trading this and that this is our first i think well this is our first personal story in a while in a while, uh, and he, yeah. in a while and hearing the real human element of the ups the downs the flaws the mistakes but also the comebacks and the triumphs um it's you know it's a very gammy's story was a very real experience like testimony of what it's like being in crypto. It's a fucking ride. It is fucking yeah. volatile. It is emotional. As, as Gammy said, you got to be a little bit crazy to be in here, especially as long as he has since 2011. Since 2011. Yeah, dude. Yeah. yeah that's, that's, that's so crazy. And I can't even imagine like the idea of cycles back then. Like, like almost obviously it mattered, right? Because mm -hmm. you can't just, um, how do I say this? Like, clearly money is tied to it but there wasn't that many eyeballs it wasn't making headlines like it probably didn't no. consume your world so then like i wonder what it was like to be in like a bear market at that time or like a yeah. bull market for example um, i mean but yeah. it must have been like we you know we thought like 2017 to 20 i mean 2018 2019 was dead i can't imagine mm -hmm. like 2015 or like 2012 how like stone cold dead lights out it was in those bear markets um, I mean, Gammy said he even left. He left twice. Yeah, yeah, he left. yeah, <laughs> exactly. yeah. No, yeah. that's that's good. And dude, but, the craziest part is like when, um, like how did how did he build conviction into like Chainlink? Like, I, I wanted to ask him, like, was there like another one that he he has like a similar level of like conviction? I think it's just and, like, Link. Just looking at his Twitter, it's just yeah. Link. But it, it just yeah. happened because he learned his lesson from Bitcoin, and he was like, all right, I'm gonna find oh, something to go like like hundred percent. 100 balls to wall in and that was link uh and then i love the part about the coincidences um and everything you know the universe just speaking to him conspiring in his favor as i said and you know he wrote that shit up he wrote that up to the 10 cents to 53 dollars dude that's so crazy that's the fact that he bought it on ether delta like he, he literally bought it at 10 cents like i told you I, like i saw it at 17 and like i like I, I remember that very vividly because then I remember even at that moment of uh, like the, the context was like I was looking at it and news about Google Cloud was being integrated with it. And I was like, oh, my God, it's one of those headlines where, you know, hey, I pay for a Google subscription and <laughs> like I have a partnership with Google Cloud. And I just remember totally fading it so hard back then. Um, yeah, not that's that was good. But yeah. the, his his conviction of like missing out on bitcoin forced him to diamond hand this one i think that's a very yeah. important lesson that's a very very important yeah. lesson and i feel like on this episode we only really got to the tip of the iceberg with gammy like i like things that if you know i would love to have him on again and just talk about him kind of coming up on ct you know all the friends he's made the you know all the experiences yeah. he had because there's like a lot there i mean i was with him a little bit at towards the end of 20, like throughout 2022 2023 um, mm -hmm. I think that would make a really good episode in the future. Kind of this, you know, the culture Dude, of CT. I would love to bring him back on like when yeah. hopefully – before the cycle ends, like near, like, dude, let, let's make a pact and bring him back on when the market is most frothy and we're just like so <laughs> crazy. Okay, we got to bring Gammy on right now. Yeah, yeah, you know, exactly. Let's, let's do that. I'd love to that. have like him and Peach on, uh, maybe like a few others on, well, maybe yeah. Voltron, and like just like talk, just talk about the culture. I think that would make a really good yeah. episode in the future. So if you guys are listening, we'd love to have you guys on. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's cool. Yeah, and make sure if you're listening, if you want to hear that episode in the future, you go ahead, hit that bell button, you go and subscribe right now. Leave us a comment, let us know what you think. Give us a like, follow us on all of our socials uh, at Flybo DeFi on Twitter, TikTok, and Telegram. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at DeFi Dave22. You can follow me at 0x capital underscore K. And we'll see you next week. Peace. Everything said on this episode is not financial or tax advice. This channel is strictly for educational purposes and is not an investment advice or solicitation to buy or sell any assets or to make any financial decisions. This video is not tax advice whatsoever. Please talk to your accountant and do your own research.